from one war to another, just a single Mediterranean sea system away. On October 7th, 2023, Hamas initiated an offensive, of sorts, against Israel, emanating from the Gaza Strip, attacking basically anything that moved, civilians included. It was larger than any similar operation in recent memory, and reminiscent of the Yom Kippur War, which began 50 years and one day prior. But whenever something like this happens, the question immediately turns to why. The answers you get from standard media sources tend to be shallow, and as someone who at least pretends to be a respectable social scientist, it is way too early for a definitive answer, unless you are watching this in 2033, and even then that may still be too soon. Nevertheless, it is worth trying. That is why today we are going to the deep end to make progress in understanding the conflict. We will begin with those shallow explanations and why they are still worth knowing. But then we will pivot to why political scientists have shifted away from those explanations over the last few decades. From there, we will cover why the status quo between the parties may have failed, with particular attention to preemptive incentives, long-term shifts in the balance of power, false optimism, and leader biases. Long-time viewers will recognize the structure of this video as similar to my prior work on the Russia-Ukraine war. If you would like a deeper dive into the broader theory of war, I suggest you watch that one. Here, I will cover the basics very quickly, thereby focusing more on the issues between Hamas and Israel. But regardless, there are still going to be plenty of lines on maps, so buckle up. Quick note on the language that I will be using today. The way political scientists define war is through a minimum of a thousand combat fatalities. The vast majority of casualties in the initial wave appear to be civilians, so they do not count toward that total. Nevertheless, the likelihood that the aftermath eventually accumulates the requisite number is high so I will be describing this as a war. In any case, we begin with what we might call the substantive issues at play. These are the literal things that one party will win or lose over the course of the conflict, like, say, the territory that sits on the eastern end of Ukraine if we were talking about Russia's invasion. Back in the Middle East, the most basic point of contention is the Gaza Strip, so named because it is a strip of land that runs along Israel and the Mediterranean Sea until you get to Egypt. In 2005, Israel vacated its settlements in the region. Two years later, Hamas fought a civil war against Fatah over political control over the region. Hamas subsequently won. In response, Egypt and Israel made permanent a blockade around the Strip. The consequences have been so stark that we do not need an artificial line to see the boundary. It is not quite the Korean Peninsula at night, but it is close. About 2.4 million people live there, but basically everything to and from Gaza has to run through Israel, which has all sorts of negative economic consequences for the region. This also created great demand for tunnels to run the blockade, and we will revisit the ridiculousness of that in the outro. Why is it always chicken? Anyway, with my sincerest apologies for glossing over about a decade and a half of history, that is more or less where things stand today. Hamas does not like its current constriction and would like to expand territory, and Israel, surprise, feels otherwise. There are some smaller substantive issues too. After the 37th Israeli government came into power at the end of December 2022, Israel began expanding settlements in the West Bank. This is confusing because the West Bank is on the eastern side of the conflict area, and the Gaza Strip is on the west side. The West Bank instead derives its name from being on the western bank of the Jordan River, and to further add to the confusion, Fatah administers that territory, not Hamas. But that might be beside the point, as we will eventually return to. Back in April, there was also an incident at the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There were rumors that a group of Jews planned to sacrifice a goat at the site, 
which would have been illegal to do so there under Israeli law. Palestinians barricaded themselves inside to ward off that possibility. However, overnight stays were also not permitted at that time. Israeli police initiated a raid to remove them, which created a new source of controversy. Now, I am not here to comment on the fairness of any of these historical positions, which long predate the recent crisis. One's perception of the truth tends to be colored by which side of the issue that person is on. As a result, on some level, the truth, the laws of war, and soldier-civilian distinctions matter less than they ought to. Indeed, there is an old saying that goes back millions of years. That war stands for, we are right, and that is not far from the truth. The problem is that substantive issues alone do not explain why conflicts occur. For this one in particular, it is not as if the underlying issues and contention have changed much over the years. And yet, the violence ebbs and flows. Something else has to be going on here as well. This is where modern crisis bargaining theory comes into play. Yep, we have reached the part of the video with the lines on maps. Those of you certified lines on maps experts can just skip to the next chapter. For the rest of us, here is the quick version of the last 30 years of political science research on war. Militarized conflicts eventually result in some sort of outcome, one way or another. Whether that outcome is more favorable or less favorable in expectation depends on the strength and the resolve of the actors. If we think about all of the possible outcomes and weigh them by their relative likelihood of happening, we get the expected outcome. Note that I am not actually saying that this line represents that for this particular conflict. I am not the CIA or otherwise, so I do not really know, and neither does anyone else who has enough spare time to be watching this video. Never mind comment on it in case you are looking down there. It is not even clear that Israel has any desire to shift territory. All I am saying is that it is possible to formulate an expectation in principle, and that it will help the visual learners out there if I pick one line and stick to it. I can also assure you that this is the type of thing that war planners and political leaders think through, even if they are not always literally doing it with lines like this. War is not free, though. If we combine all of the loss of life and economic waste for Israel, and then convert that into square kilometers of land, we get the space between the white and blue lines. Making conversions like that might sound grim, until you realize that this is exactly the trade-off that military planners have to think about every day. Interestingly, by definition, Israel's value for fighting is everything below the blue line. It is thus Israel's metaphorical red line, meaning that any outcome drawn above it is better than what Israel obtains through conflict. We can do the same thing for Hamas going the other way, with its costs between the white and green lines, and so everything below the green line is preferable to conflict from Hamas's perspective. The key insight is that anything between the green and blue lines is a settlement that is mutually preferable to fighting. Moreover, as long as war is costly, such a range of settlements must always exist. They will not necessarily make either side happy, it is just that they are better than the alternative for both parties. This is why borders worldwide tend to be relatively stable. The international community tries to draw them in a way that is not going to immediately provoke a war. Well, most of the time, anyway. This same logic applies to more abstract issues of contention, like self-determination, which may make more sense here if Israel is not interested in changing the border. It is just that self-determination meters do not have the same visual appeal as lines on maps, and thus we tend to illustrate them this way. Well, there's also the straight-up math, but that seems like an even worse idea. The key insight here is that the substantive issues alone are not enough to explain why wars occur.
We also need to explain why the parties chose a costly solution, when a cheaper, more peaceful alternative also existed. In other words, war only occurs in the presence of both a substantive issue at stake and what we will call a bargaining friction. Take away either, and you get peace. The problem you see in the media or history textbooks is that standard analysis tends to place all of the focus on the substantive explanations. But that is not good enough for us lines-on-maps folk. We need to explore the bargaining frictions as well. First up is first strike advantages and preemptive war. The basic idea here is that no single expected outcome of war exists. Rather, the expectation is a function of who initiated it. For example, if a clever first strike by one side leaves the other helpless, then the expected outcome moves over here, and the minimum demand in negotiations that was originally here now correspondingly shifts down here. Similar first strike advantages might also exist for the other side, with the other cost line moving up along with it. This can take us to a point where the minimum acceptable deal to avoid a first strike from one side is unacceptable to the other. Coincidentally, the Yom Kippur War is often cited as an example of this mechanism in action, though the Arab coalition ultimately failed to achieve their objectives. Moreover, part of the motivation for Israel's nuclear program, a topic that we recently touched on, was to deter Arab states from attacking core areas of Israel. That would limit the effectiveness of an opposing first strike, which in turn reduced the chances of wars starting in the first place. There is evidence that something like this was at play with the recent crisis. Israeli intelligence failed to pick up on what was happening, and Hamas used some unconventional tactics to catch Israel off guard, attacking via bulldozers, and paragliders, of all things. Be prepared to hear failure of imagination a ton in reference to the situation, a term coined in response to a different paradigm-shifting event. There is also some evidence that intelligence on the situation had become politically polarized more generally. In fact, Israel had been redeploying soldiers from Gaza to the West Bank during the lead-up to the conflict, incorrectly believing that the greater threat was there. But whether Hamas's first strike advantage was so great that it overrode the total costs of engagement is unclear. Researchers who study war are generally skeptical of how big first strike advantages are, and Hamas's lack of a plan after the initial phase means that it is not further exploiting that surprise. Another problem is long-term power shifts and preventive war. This looks similar to the story with first strike advantages. If the distribution of power looks like this now, but will look like this in the future, it might be tempting to lock in this share minus costs for yourself with war now, knowing that the best you can possibly get from a settlement later is over here. The main focus regarding power shifts is on Saudi Arabia, which has been in long-term negotiations, to normalize relations with Israel. With Saudi Arabia and Israel working together, Hamas's coercive leverage could be adversely affected. This is similar to how the Camp David Accords reoriented Israel's relationships with countries beyond Egypt and strengthened its position elsewhere. From Hamas's perspective, an offensive could serve two purposes here. First, it could drive a wedge in negotiations and stop the agreement from happening at all, forestalling the power shift altogether. For example, if Hamas baits Israel into overreacting and causing too many civilian deaths in Gaza, then normalization may become politically untenable for Saudi Arabia. Avoiding civilian casualties will be no easy task. Most of the Gaza Strip has an incredibly high population density, and it is hard to see how Israel could go through there cleanly. The preventive incentive is also why Iran's name keeps popping into the conversation. Iran and Saudi Arabia have a major rivalry, most prominently played out by proxy in Yemen's civil war.
Iran would be the biggest loser if relations normalized. And thus, there is speculation that Iran assisted Hamas in preparing the attack, which Hamas has been happy to stoke, though Iran denies it, and there is no confirmation at the time of this recording. The initial indications from U.S. intelligence is that Iran did not see it coming, while simultaneously Iran's broader assistance to Hamas broadly connects Tehran to the attack. That said, keep in mind that Iran would want to keep its potential role quiet, as interference might give Saudi Arabia reason to complete an accord. Second, if Israel and Saudi Arabia are going to normalize relations one way or another, this could be a final attempt to try something to alter the status quo. If successful, it might make it more difficult for Israel to move things back in its favor, even if the Saudi relationship evolves. For example, if Israeli civilians decide that living along the border region is just not worth the risk anymore, and an attack comes at a lower cost now than it would post-Saudi normalization, then it may be worthwhile. Next up is information problems. The basic idea here is that one side knows something that the other one does not. For example, perhaps Hamas is not sure about whether the balance of power looks relatively favorable, or if it is relatively unfavorable. If you are relatively optimistic, then you may press for deep concessions. The rub is that if the other side knows it is strong, they stand firm and you have a war on your hands. The story here is that the last nine months of Israeli domestic politics has been especially contentious, with judicial reforms front and center. The backlash included reservists refusing to report for duty as an act of civil disobedience. One interpretation is that Hamas misread the situation, thinking that an offensive would exacerbate the political divisions. That assessment appears to be wrong, however, as there were immediate talks of Netanyahu forming a unity government, and sure enough, that happened shortly thereafter. To a lesser extent, there may have been an expectation that the West was distracted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but that also appears to have been a miscalculation, with the White House having a clear opinion on how to interpret the actions. The final possibility for today is leader benefits. War may be costly for a polity as a whole, but not for the leaders making the decisions. Visually, this idea rejects the assumption that war is costly. The cost lines then collapse and become benefits instead, leaving no bargaining range to negotiate over. The micro-foundations for this within the Middle East are well-developed. In fact, within my traditional academic career, I have written extensively on the subject. Imagine that there is an audience receptive to violence. Some of them are willing to volunteer for an organization. Others have money that they would like to donate. Under such conditions, organizations have incentive to commit violence as a perverse form of advertisement. They want to persuade those individuals to support their group and not the other. In essence, the apparent madmen act as admen. Within the context of Israel-Palestine, the incentive for Hamas is to compete against Fatah and win some segment of support. The problem is that this incentive has been around forever. It is not like the book was trying to predict the future. Thus, the mechanism by itself does not explain why we are observing the violence right now. Indeed, and zooming out for a moment, it is next to impossible to make strong claims about which of these mechanisms triggered the war, or if it was a mysterious missing factor that is difficult to observe as outside analysts. And probably the better question is not which, but how much of each. The bottom line is that we are not privy to the intelligence reports that states have, and even the intelligence of those involved has struggled. But the war is not going to change the underlying diametrically opposed preferences between the actors. Rather, what will end it is resolving which of these bargaining problems is the true driver of the conflict. If you want to know more about bargaining failure and the causes of war, check out my book on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
It is a different subject, but it serves as a more in-depth introduction to the school of thought. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. Remember how there are tunnels that run under the Gaza Strip to break Egypt and Israel's blockade? Yeah, they are used for weapons. But they also create a black market economy for basically everything, including fried chicken. In 2013, a 12-piece bucket from KFC was yours for the bargain price of just $27. Only about a 135% markup. Now that's a deal.